So uh, now it's time for Kate uh, Dimmock who to uh, to talk about more sort of outreach and how to how to transfer knowledge uh, of of this this type of craft. And I think you you work a lot. You don't maybe work in historic gardens so much as sort of more like sort of countryside settings. But uh, obviously it's the same concept anyway. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same, same skills, maybe yes. a different, different background. Um, so, and and uh, you're a representative of the a Dry Stone Walling Association, uh, Great Britain, right? Yeah, yeah. So I work for um, the Dry Stone Walling Association as their training and education coordinator. Um, so what that basically entails is that I will lead on um, delivering courses, uh, training, demonstrations, all of that. Um, so if you haven't heard of uh, the DSWA before, um, we are generally uh, UK based. We were created in 1968 um, with the aim to advance education uh, in the craft and heritage of dry stone walling. Um, so that's, that's our main focus really as a charity. Uh, so how do we go about that? Hang on, I think... so. Yeah. Me you working with me we'll uh, sign off now and just hand it over to you so just uh, okay yeah. yeah take it away <laughs> okay, okay no worries okay doke. so the aims then of uh, the dswa or dry stone wall in association um these come obviously from that charitable aim about education in the craft um our main ones are these four so skills for the future we obviously want to maintain uh, the dry stone walling skill uh, for future generations because once we lose the skills, we obviously lose the dry stone walls. And here in uh, the UK, Great Britain, they are very iconic with some of our countryside. So, for instance, our national parks like the Lake District and um, in Yorkshire, they're synonymous really with uh, that type of landscape. There's no formal uh, college courses here in the UK for dry stone walling skills. So it's very traditional in the sense that it's a passing of knowledge from one craftsperson to another. Um, so as a charity, we try and maintain the momentum of that to keep it going uh, and encourage people to pass on their skills. And obviously there needs to be career opportunities for people, uh, especially for young people being attracted into the craft that they have a pathway uh, to follow, to take up dry stone walling. School leavers, um, for instance, don't necessarily know of dry stone walling as a career. It's not something they may have come across before. Um, so we need to attract them into dry stone walling. Uh, here in the UK, there's probably a concept that dry stone walling is very agricultural uh, walls, that type of construction. Whereas there is um, a whole plethora of different dry stone walling construction that you can do. Uh, you can see on your screen something that one of our master craftsmen, Andrew Loudon, uh, created in um, a formal garden. So how can we provide career opportunities? At the top of your screen, you'll see a young lad named David, who's just completed his year's apprenticeship with us. Unfortunately, our apprenticeships and training bursaries are very funding based, um, so it's not something that we can offer all the time, but we do as funding comes available. And we want to enhance the condition of walls. There's large stretches of dry stone walls in the UK. Unfortunately, they are falling into disrepair. Um, it may be that in those areas, there's not the craftspeople there to uphold them. Maybe the farmers don't have uh, the funding available to keep them um, in good condition. So that's something that we're very aware of. Um, and we want to train people up to tackle this and um, to rebuild the walls where possible and ensure that they remain for future generations. And then, of course, we want to increase the traditional skill base. We don't want to just continue it. Um, we found in the past that it's a decreasing um, skill here in the UK. So we want to increase it. Um, and we do this by offering qualifications in dry stone walling. And this just ensures that we're passing on the skill to a certain standard that we've worked very hard to establish. Um, and it also helps us to measure 
how many people are interested in taking up the skill, not just uh, for a personal interest, but also in pursuing it as a career. So how can we go about um, achieving our aims? We have a different, um, different training courses that we offer. Um, the main way through these um, that most individuals will go along is starting at a beginner course, um, which is generally they're run out at our branches across the UK. Uh, they're quite fun courses um, for people that just want to find out a little bit more. They might then decide that they, they definitely are interested in dry stone walling and they want to progress into one of our intensive four day courses. And the ultimate aim from our point of view is to encourage people um, down the certification route and for them to start seeking qualifications in dry stone walling. For most people, uh, they will start at the beginner courses that I mentioned. Now, these are led by our branches. Uh, we have 18 branches all across the UK. Uh, we have the northernmost one on the Isle of Skye in Scotland, uh, through to Cotswold and southwest of England. And um, so we, we cover a wide geographical location with our branches and they offer two day courses. And um, these are aimed at people that have never done dry stone walling before. Um, maybe they've been out in the countryside, they've seen dry stone walls, uh, they've got a bit of interest, they want to learn how they were made, a bit more about them. So these courses are designed to be very fun, very interesting and engaging um, not too serious um, everyone will work as a group they'll strip down a wall as you see in the video uh, playing now and they will then rebuild it uh, they will be led by one of our DSWA instructors um, at branch level all our instructors have gone through an instructor course that we've delivered so that just trains them up um, to be able to effectively communicate um, how to build a dry stone wall and the key features. Um, so that's our beginner courses. Uh, that's just covering basic skills. And from there, uh, we have a lot of people that want to uh, progress more, maybe have a bit more of an in-depth knowledge, uh, refine their personal skills, opposed to working in a group. And then they will head to our national training site. At the moment, our national training site is in the northwest of England, and we have a variety of uh, training walls, which are, are dedicated uh, just for teaching purposes. We have a mixture of stone on site that people can um, train with. So we have two main training walls that you see, uh, sandstone uh, and limestone. So that they give people uh, a bit of experience of working with the different stone that they might find. Obviously, in the UK, there's vast differences in the stone, uh, depending whereabouts you go. If you go up to Scotland, it will be a lot different than if you're working in Derbyshire or the Cotswolds. Um, but this gives participants the basic skills that they need to strip down and rebuild either a freestanding wall, which will be the middle part, or a cheek end or wall end, which you can see in the bottom picture uh, that those chaps are looking at. Um, now, these courses are led by a Master Craftsman instructor. So Master Craftsman is the highest uh, qualification that we offer. All our Master Craftsman instructors have decades of experience behind them and what that um, allows them to do uh, in their day-to-day work their professional dry stone wall as it should add so they can um, help the participants with that knowledge and the participants gain uh, invaluable tips about um, building dry stone walling from those guys it's a very intensive style this four day course so the four days are back to back uh, so it can be quite physically demanding for people that haven't done dry stone walling before um, but most people that come on these four-day courses, uh, these courses run Monday through to Thursday, they're looking at following the certification route. Um, maybe they are looking at dry stone walling as a career, or we also have quite a few people that are retired professionals from 
other backgrounds that are volunteers for different organisations. So, for instance, uh, the National Trust or the Woodland Trust, we have quite a few people um, join us from there. So it just equips them with the skills they need to build dry stone walls. And from there, they can move on to the certification route. Now, not everyone um, is interested in following this route, but we do have an awful lot of people who take up the level one. So if they've done the four day training course, they may as well stop for the fifth day and do their assessment in their level one. And what this demands of people is that they strip down and rebuild a freestanding wall of 2.5 meters squared um, in a seven and a half hour period. So it's very demanding uh, in terms of the time frame. Um, but happy to say in 2023, we've had 100% success rate. So once people have been trained up in that uh, training course, they're fully equipped to um, set two on their level one. Now, I should just say that we run our certification days globally. So we, in September, run certification days in the US, in Canada. We've got a day in Australia in March next year. So it's um, the certification that we offer is globally recognized. So we're, we're quite proud of that. Once they've done their level one then, uh, they can move on to their level two, which is the first of our qualifications that we deem to be um, one for professional dry stone wallers. It's technically very demanding. So as you can see in the picture, all these chaps are around the level two stint of a wall end or a cheek end. The terminology uh, differs depending whereabouts in the country you are. But it's basically that section of wall that you can see right at the end. Um, and how that ties in to the wall behind it. And then we can move on to the level three. Um, this is solely for professional dry stone wallers and it brings in uh, two different parts. So we bring in uh, the idea of features um, for this level. There's one feature which is in the photograph in front of you um, again, the terminology differs. So um, we call it a lunky, which basically is just a hole in an agricultural wall which lets sheep through. Um, terminology varies uh, depending on region. Um, but that's one of the features that they need to build. They need to build a curved section of wall and then they have a time test on a retaining wall. Um, so that is technically quite difficult. And then we move on to master craftsmen. Now this is um, the elite, if you will, of the uh, dry stone walling world in terms of our certification. We only actually have 54 master craftsmen on our books. Um, so that's taken into account master craftsmen who achieved it uh, many, many years ago. Generally, we only have maybe one um, master craftsman undertake their tests every year so not a lot of people get to this level or possibly they don't really want to get to this level it's specifically for professional dry stone wallers who really want to make a business out of building features or anything like that in terms of what they need to do then uh, there's two features including building a dry stone wall on a sloped wall uh, sloped wall that would be good a sloped bit of ground and um, so that's quite difficult in terms of actually achieving that getting your materials up that sloped section of ground um, and being able to tie the uh, stone into one another then they've still got a time test aspect um, but this is building a feature so such as this pillar and um, that you can see um, it's a lot to build uh, within a seven and a half hour period. So they really need to be able to uh, know what they're doing. And realistically, after our training courses, the reason that we're doing this um, is just to bring more people on board and to keep this skill alive. We found that an awful lot of people are interested in dry stone walling. They want to try it. Um, a few of them 
for instance, on the background, you can see two young lads. Um, they wanted to take it forward as a career option. Luckily, we had uh, funding available at that time, so they did apprenticeships. Um, but we find that it can be a bit of a barrier um, over here in terms of getting youngsters on board and encouraging them to take it up. Because obviously, it's a traditional route. We uh, rely heavily on our master craftsmen, um, dry stone wallers, to take on board um, young, young adults to train them up. It obviously takes a lot of time resources and um, so we are funding based for those opportunities but we, we've reached um, a lot of people with our training courses uh, we want to push them further but they're, uh, they're quite popular at the moment so we're booked up until the end of July 2024 and um, so it's looking very optimistic in terms of how many people want to train in dry stone walling and want to take it up and um, and we're hoping that we can get some more apprenticeships up and running this year. Um, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. This is this is very inspirational. I uh, <laughs> I think this is a lovely system and and one that really ensures that it sort of stays alive. Yeah, uh, that's key for us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just having an association is is a very good start. I think. I'm sure we have one. <laughs> yeah, we are very lucky in that respect. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we've got some questions, and mm -hmm. uh, this is a uh, we have a session now with some Q and A until uh, half past. So, Joachim, uh, if you want to, sh Joachim Lilia, if you want to show your face again, uh, you can join in here. Yeah. We we start with. Um, <clears throat> With with a question here in the Q and A area, with um, historical dry stone wall preservation, uh, should we remove every upgrowing plant, or should we leave plants like ferns and perennials that might not destroy the walls, like trees would? Yeah, um, <laughs> that's um. Some plants don't uh, destroy the wall, so and I think it's beautiful. Some plants growing in the wall, and I think someone would say, "No, you have to take everything away." So <laughs> I think maybe yeah. it depends on who you ask. But if the this, the problem is if the roots uh, will mm. will uh, like blow apart stones in the wall, or what you, mm. you say, um, then there is a problem. But if they don't, there is no problem. And the trees, the roots uh, often search for water. So if there is water under or behind the wall, the roots might uh, be searching that way and uh, destroy the wall. So if it's dry and uh, the roots are not harming the wall, it's okay, uh, if you oh. ask me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I imagine, I mean, I mean, there are some plants that have very, very shallow root systems like sedums and sempervivum, you know, plants like that mm. would probably be quite harmless. But, but it's hard mm. to know with other perennials how deep they go and you know, permeate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you have to keep an eye on them. If you see any changes in the wall, you have to take them off. Right. Mm. Uh, and um, is it possible to make a wall like this without geotextile or isn't that advisable yeah so if we're doing it historically yeah well i think this old wall uh, i showed was the answer it has been there for 200 years uh, and it shows not no sign of uh, yeah it's it looks like very it looks very nice so under the right conditions, you don't have to use the geotextile. But oh, yes, it is uh, advisable today in the modern building. Yes. Okay. So it was made properly with geotextile and this big material that is very uh, drainage, that drains the, away the water. So it was, it was correctly in one way, but the historical wall shows that you can do it in, in other ways too. That works. Yeah. I, I suppose again, it's it's kind of like making a new planting. Like a lot of the groundwork is what sets the basis for how well it will do over time. Like you, it's not about the what's on top; it's about what's under mm. underground usually, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Kate, uh, Kate asks, uh, for the other Kate, uh, are there any <laughs> master crafts women in the UK? Yeah, we've got quite a few. In fact, um, the youngest, the term craftsman is uh, all encompassing yeah. that we use. Um, but the youngest master craftsman that we've got on our books um, was achieved by a lady called Lydia Noble, um, who was, I think, 22, 23 when she achieved master craftsman. So that she was one of the youngest ones that's ever achieved it. Um, nice. So, yeah, we've got quite a few. And we've got more coming on board, which is good to see. Great. Uh, Mercy has posted another poll for us here. Uh, so please click on that link. And it says, uh, what types of walls do you have in your garden? Do you have like dry stone walls or do you have walls with mortar or such? So please answer that. Um, is there like a similar education in Sweden? Uh, you work in what, what does it look like education wise for this type of stuff? Uh, no, there's nothing I know about. No, I took, a, I think, one or two day course in spring, but it, it would be the yeah. equivalent of the introduction level, I think, in the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some sometimes there is some short one two day courses. Yeah, but not at all like we saw from England. That's something else. <laughs> Gunnebo has uh, is is trying to get get uh, push through uh, an application to to start a longer uh, mm. course for professionals to to get green professionals or uh, people to actually. Yeah, start working with this, but uh, it's uh, state funded, so we'll see what they say. Uh, we were handing in the application uh, in uh, February or so, and I think we were gonna we we're gonna hear a little bit more about it toward the end yeah. here. Uh, so so we we're hoping to 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 start one uh, at Gunnebo, but uh, it's in the hands yeah. of the state. Yeah, I think it was uh, nice. You said, Kate, you you have only fifty two masters. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Do we have two or? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big difference. That's just really nice to see. Um, yeah. No, I yeah. do lose sight of that. We we get a bit, um, yeah, blinked it over here about <laughs> how lucky we are. You yeah. are. You are in this in this sense. You are, and yeah. I think it's interesting because it seems uh, that like there there are many professional opportunities, and while there is a demand in Sweden, it seems that if there's a more of a demand in UK. If more, that many people can keep. Um, you know getting yeah. paid to do this uh, work <laughs> that's lovely mm. um, I think there's a question here I think it is for you Kate because mm -hmm. I think it's from your images do the top stones the, the vertically placed stones have a practical function or is it just decorative yeah. yeah so the top stones we call them uh, cope stones um, where where I am again regional terms change um, but the the practical function is for our walls and um, they've got two two sides to them, two faces. So the cope stones sit on top and help tie them together. So a dry stone wall um, during different weather conditions, they kind of like expand, they move. Um, so the, the copes just help tie them together. And there's another stone further down the wall called a through, which runs the whole length. Uh, and it just gives it a bit more stability, really. Right. And it does make them look nice. Yeah. It does, it does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, there's a plan to start an education, a shorter education in uh, Norway as well. Uh, Ingeborg writes in the chat, so that's nice to see. Oh, brilliant! Great, great. Um, Joachim, do you see any difference between when you were working with a project and today? Like, do you, would you say there are more or fewer practitioners, or like? Uh, yeah, I was more thinking... demand. Like, is there more interest uh, from? With thinking walls. about it when I put together these pictures and I, yeah. I because I haven't worked with this for a few years so I am I'm not really sure actually mm. what the situation is today but uh, if there is a, this short course they will often be filled with participants yeah. so I think there's an interest I think so too on, on that I level. hear a lot from the from the cemetery side like they yeah. have massive uh, demand yeah uh, for repairs and Maybe yeah. Things, yeah. Yes, we have quite a lot of stone walls and structures that need uh, maintenance right now, and uh, it. I think it's it's still too few people who work with this. Um, absolutely, in Sweden. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Don't forget to answer the poll, please, because uh, we will move on to the next question in a while. 
Um, okay, so the Swedish, the Church of Sweden has some internal uh, courses for for their uh, staff, and uh, that's okay. great to hear. I uh, yeah, I, I suppose that's a way of solving the problem when nobody else is doing it um, mm. to just build your mm -hmm. own courses. Yeah. Um, what is uh, the main advantage of dry stone walls over the ones with mortar? What would you say, guys? Uh, yeah. Well, well more... okay. Oh, okay, you take it, Kate. <laughs> I was going to say, from our perspective, um, it comes back to weather, really. Um, mortar, the stones haven't got the flexibility to move. If they move, then the mortar starts to crack. Um, and especially here, where the weather has been appalling, um, if rain or water gets in and then freezes uh, in into the mortar, uh, then it starts to break apart and then it, it just starts to fall down. Whereas if you haven't got that aspect, it's just dry stone with the traditional um, coursing and the way of building. It's a lot more flexible, so it survives a lot better in um, the harsh weather conditions we've got especially. Um, so that's that's really why we choose dry stone over mortared. So more mortared walls would be more common in the sort of warmer climates, like drier, warmer. Um, climates. they tend. We do see them an awful lot uh, in the UK. It tends to be more people's perception of them that they will um stop up longer. But as you said before, um when you're looking at traditional dry stone walls, they've been up hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, so I think that perception isn't exactly based on fact. <laughs> no. no. But then if you have a, a stone wall in a house, for example, or um, uh, a cellar that needs to be insulated, that's a different thing than you can. Okay, yeah. Uh, but then you, you have to protect it from rain. As Kate said, it, it cannot be wet. It must right. be a roof or something to protect it. Yes, yeah, yeah. so you can see some mortared walls with like actual t uh, tile roofs on yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, at least here. Yeah. All right. Um, so um, in the UK, do the rural uh, dry stone walls still serve their original purpose of like keeping animals in or out? Or uh, like, is there a practical incentive to maintaining them because in in sweden i would say no uh, to that yeah um especially when you get to the national parks so like um, the lake district yorkshire places in wales and um, the farmers in those areas cannot take out the dry stone walls they couldn't replace them really with uh, fencing or anything because they're protected um, so there needs to be a good reason for them to be able to remove them and it they're um, covered really by DEFRA. Uh, outside of the agricultural aspect, it, it, it's a bit different. Um, yeah, but, but yeah, we're not they, allowed they to remove them, but we people put fencing next to them, basically. Right? Yeah, yeah, they they still very much um, keep in livestock, um, especially in those traditional areas. Yeah, that's nice because then I mean, it, it does help if 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 you're not just doing it for conservation. Uh, I mean, it, it really does help if you can actually use what you're doing yeah yeah so definitely. That's, that's nice to hear um okay um okay let's uh let's move uh, um let's put in another poll question mercy uh put put the next one in the chat please we'll have a look at that and let's have a look at my questions so i mean what uh in the uk like who are the sort of main employee employees like uh, employers? Uh, is it is it the sort of national parks or uh, is that or like who um, do you work for if if you're working with this stuff? They tend to work for themselves. They dry stone wallers over here tend to be one man gangs. Um, yeah, but but who who tends... gives them jobs? Um, it it varies really. So um people at one end of the spectrum they might just be employed by uh, farmers to go around agricultural walls uh, but there's more of a demand now for um, features in gardens or that type of construction opposed to just a wall and um, so for instance uh, two of our master craftsmen built dry stone uh, features 
in the best in show at uh, Chelsea this year. Oh, right. Okay. So the, there's quite a demand from a, a garden designer point of view um, to build special features or artistic installations and things like that. Uh, but obviously, the dry stone wallers who are doing that tend to be the master craftsmen or who who've been professionals for quite a few years. Um, yeah. 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 Right. Okay, so the next poll question is, uh, what are the main threats to dry stone walls where you are, uh, where you're working, where you're living? What's uh, what's going on with them? That's not so great. Uh, and I think uh, we can suspect that water will be mentioned here. Maybe water and trees, it would be my guess. But uh, what, what would you say, Joachim? Uh, yeah, and the lack of maintenance. And yeah. You don't... Um fix the walls when they fall down part of the wall falls down and it and it doesn't get uh, fixed and the wall starts more and more but, fall down so, yes but trees of course yeah but like how how much maintenance like why why do they fall down if if they're well made what happens um uh, yeah but Sometimes they do. It could be a wild animal jumping on the wall right, yeah. or something like that. It's different. Or wild or uh, trees. Chil children or adults. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or trees, as you said. Um, sometimes uh, one part of the wall can be poorly constructed from the beginning and you have to re remake it to, to make it good again. Uh, yeah. Things like that. So that the, where, where you get things falling down, it could be a sign of just not not doing the job uh, yeah. from the beginning right yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah that makes sense um let's see here uh kate says yeah in in wales they appear to have a type of wall where trees are purposely planted on the top mm. uh, yeah and um, the, yeah. the, there is a type of walling uh, that we see here in UK is not technically dry stone walling, but it kind of brings in the same thought process. It's called Cornish hedging. Um, so it's got dry stone walling as the, the base, if you will, but it's got um, soil rather than the, the stone hearting. Um, and then you'll see plants on top of that generally. Um, and I, I, I'm afraid, Kate, I cannot pronounce the Welsh type of walling. <laughs> Um, it's very Welsh sounding um, and I can't quite get to grasp with it but there is um, a Welsh type of walling as well which is similar to that Cornish hedging in style right yeah and Jan says yeah in Norway they have examples of sh uh, shrubs like black currants being uh, planted on top of dry rock walls interesting and um, and Espen says about the maintenance that they, they have to maintain and they are made for regular maintenance and uh, Unlike a wall made with mortar, uh, yeah. it's it's so sort of more supposed to just stand there and not require maintenance if you do your, the job right. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Let's see here if we got some questions coming in. Yeah, maybe we should move on to the next poll question. Uh, uh, okay, lilacs planted on dry stone walls as well. All right. Yeah. Well, there are always exceptions, aren't there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, do you, yeah, Kate, do you teach the aspect of uh, biodiversity uh, in stone walls in the courses? Uh, well, the courses, and I see there's a, there was another one about maintenance as well. So the, the courses do encapsulate um, the idea of maintenance and also the, the benefits to high stone walling. Uh, it's just not focused on that it's more focused because we've only got a short time it's very to concentrated with, right yeah. yeah it's very concentrated on the practical how to build it yeah. but yeah we we bring in um the idea of the um the benefits especially the biological diversity bit yeah i think we need that uh, as an argument for why we should still have them in some cases and uh we are actually going to hear about that very soon here uh, in the webinar so i'm looking forward to that um because yeah, uh, but don't forget to click on the next poll question, uh, which is um, okay. Is there a time of the year when stone walls shouldn't be worked on? Uh, that that you uh, 
uh, like when you when you feel like it's it's uh, not recommended. And I think this is more about the biodiversity. So I, th I think we will uh, mm -hmm. actually ask uh, the next speaker this question as well. And uh, but but have you have you guys in the audience been told that this time of year you don't work on your walls because somebody's living there or breeding there or whatever? Feel free to answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's see here. I think we're good question wise right now. Looks like so I think actually I'm going to say thank you to uh, to both of you and uh, um, moving Much. on to the next speaker. So thank you, thank you very thank much. You. You're welcome, and Kate. Uh, in the end panel, uh, I think you can ask questions to basically all the speakers. So um, they, they can all return. So so keep asking questions in the chat. And if it's for a specific person, you can write their name before your question. We stick around. Yes, exactly. They're here in the background.